what I'm going to try and do is, is paint the picture from the start to the finish of pretty much every transaction that takes place in our industry and where each entity falls and who they are and what role they play. Does that make sense? And I may ask questions, all right? That's to kind of keep you awake. Um, if I ask a question, I promise, one, it's not a trick question, and two, it's probably very simple, all right? The reason being, neither I nor you want to sit here for 45 minutes trying to figure out what the capital of, you know, I don't know, Swaziland is, right? Like, that's, that's not what we're here to do. So if I ask you a question, it's because I expect that you should know the answer, and it's more just to make sure you're awake. So, like, Ty, if I was like, oh, what's one plus one? Two. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so it's not like, oh, man, I just can't do but he wouldn't ask me if it was that simple. No, I, I promise, it's that simple, okay? All right, so, um, so basically, step back for a second, forget everything you know, everything you've learned working here so far, and think of this almost as a layman. Okay? You presumably are not volunteering, right? Do we have any volunteers in here? No. Okay, so everybody works for, for, some, for some money, right? Yes? Okay. So you are there for, you're a what? Employee. You're an employee. Yes, thank you. See how easy this is? That's it. You guys can go now. That's awesome. No, all right, so everything really starts with the employee, okay? And right here, right now, I'm going to give you the first sort of slang term. A lot of the time we refer to an employee as an EE. And now you know why. Right? It's pretty deep, right? No, seriously. Um, now, to be an employee, you need what? A job, okay. And a job with whom? Employer. An employer. All right. This is going to be easy. You know, this is usually where I lose people. Right? We never call employers ERs. I don't know why. Probably because we're in medicine, so you know that would be confusing. Which, you know, I say that that we don't call employers ERs because it would be confusing, and yet we do call short-term disability STD, which is this is good. <laughs> so, all right, there we go. Employer. So we got the employer and we got the employee. Okay, and what they've got is an employment contract, okay? Did anybody here go to law school? Good, good decision. Okay, if you go to law school, what they would teach you is that a contract, uh, shorthand for a contract, is a K. Does anybody here know why K stands for contract? Instead of C. Instead of C. Because C probably stands for something else. Hmm. Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. <laughs> I'm assuming you're right. I'm thinking, you know, I actually was thinking it might be because, you know, C is the symbol for a copyright. Yeah. You know, so, you know. Maybe it's from Latin. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe it's something from Latin. I mean, who knows? Because copyrights are relatively recent, or at least more recent than contracts, but I don't know. Don't ask me. Okay. Okay, it's from contract. Don't tell Sesame Street. Okay, so employers, employee, contract, you sometimes refer to an employee as an EE. Now, um, why, why, besides getting to spend time with me. Why do you work here? Like, why do you work at all? And what's the purpose money. of getting money. a job? Money. Really? Mine is a sense of self-satisfaction, but okay, uh, fine. Yeah. Cash, all right, good. So you're getting, you're getting money, right? All right, money. So that's what, salary, right? Salary, okay, cool. Um, what else do you get as part of this employment contract? Self-esteem. Okay, all right, that's fair. Not everybody gets it, but I'm glad you feel good about yourself. Health insurance, right, benefits, right? Okay, but for... For our purposes, let's say let's say benefits, right? Slash, you know, we'll call it H. I'm trying to fit it all in there. But health insurance benefits. Okay, so those are the things you're getting as part of your contract. So you've got your employer, you've got your employee, you got your salary, you got your benefits, including health insurance, all part of the employee-employer relationship. All right, that's the first relationship. Right? Remember relationships in the name of the PDU? See how we're doing there? Good sweet. Uh, for sure. So, when it comes to health insurance, all right, an employer who purchases health insurance for their employee, they've got a decision to make. Okay, and this is a decision that you, as individuals, 
don't really make. All right. When you're talking about other types of insurance, um, Joe, do you have a car? Yeah. Okay. Is it insured? Mm -hmm. Okay. How did you pick your insurer? Like, who, who's your who's your auto insurer? Liberty Mutual. Liberty Mutual. Okay, good brand, right? Okay, Liberty Mutual. And once a year or whenever you renew your policy, do they look at where you live? Mm -hmm. They look at what you drive. Mm -hmm. um, they look at your driving record. Mm -hmm. You know what they're doing? I'm trying to see if I can either up my um, premium. premium. Your premium, okay. And why? Why in general? If you, if you could think of one word that would cause them to raise or lower the premium. It's because you are a high or low risk. 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 It's also a board game. You know? uh, it takes a lot of time. I don't have time to play risk anymore. Nope. Those were the days when you had time for that. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah, risk. Risk is one of the key, the key elements when you talk about insurance, okay? I, like you, I have auto insurance. Most of us, if you have a car, you buy auto insurance. They, they assess the risk, right? They assess the risk, and then they say, because you're a really good driver, because you're a really bad driver, because you drive a, you know, a, a, a junk car, because you drive a new Mercedes, because you live in a really nice town, because you live in a really bad town, because, you know, all those different stuff. Our actuaries, they took the numbers, they crunched it, and they spit this premium at you, right? This premium. And you pay this premium, you know, once a year, once every quarter, once a month, however it's set up, you pay this premium. And it's set. It's a set number until the policy renews. Right? You all get that. So here's a question. Let's say I'm an insurance carrier, and you're my insured, and I decide you're not very risky, you've never had an accident, never had a speeding ticket, you live in a really good neighborhood, your car is, you know, no offense, but it wouldn't cost that much to fix if I had to, so... So I, so I offer you a really low premium, okay? And you're paying it every month, and you're paying it every month, and then one day, bam, you total your car. Okay, you had this accident. I didn't predict that. I thought you were low risk. You had that accident, mid-year. Right there and then, do I get to increase your premiums? No, no, I don't. I have to wait until the policy renews the next year. Now you're gonna be a much higher risk, so I'm gonna charge you higher premiums, Insurance, the way we understand it as consumers who buy auto insurance like that, where they assess the risk and you pay the premium, it's like a gamble. All right, the insurance carrier, if they take the premium every month, and the end of the year you don't have a single accident, there's not a single claim, do they reimburse you the premium money? Do they say, hey, great job, here's a check, keep your money? No, they, they pocket it. They win, they win the gamble. If let's say I assess you as a low risk and you end up having four accidents that year, every accident hurts me worse than it hurts you because now I've lost the gamble. But that's what insurance is. Insurance is somebody else taking the risk off your shoulders, putting it on their own shoulders, and hoping and praying that they guess the premium right. And when you look at a premium, a premium consists of a lot of stuff, all right? If you look under it under a microscope, a premium consists of money to pay your claims, money to pay other people's claims. Because remember, I only charge so much for you because I thought you were low risk. You end up having an accident. Where am I getting the money to pay for your car? Not just from you. It's from everybody else in here. And you know what this group of people is called? The risk pool. The risk pool. Because even if I lose on her gamble, I'm hoping overall I win on all of you. And the bigger the risk pool, the more likely I am to win. You getting it so far? Okay, cool. So I've got money from you to pay for you, money from you to pay for everybody else going into the pool. Uh, I've got money to pay for my operating expenses, right? Insurance companies, they've got employees too, just like us, right? You gotta pay for their benefits, right? Their salary. Um, you know, pay for the stuff in the vending machine, right? Anybody here ever driven down Interstate 84 through Hartford, Connecticut? We got one, two, three, four people. And you see sort of the Aetna headquarters, right? You know, Cigna. Those are big buildings, right? Really fancy, impressive buildings. Yeah, those things cost money. Those weren't donated. Okay? And then there's profit. These companies, these insurance carriers, are for-profit organizations. They're making money, too. So all that goes into the premium. 
Now, what I've just described over the last five, ten minutes here is what's called fully funded insurance. All right? I can write the whole thing, but we've got fully funded insurance. And really, the way to identify fully funded insurance is that they charge premium. Right? And premium, like we just discussed, are all those things. Profit and everything else. And also, it's never returned. Your money is theirs the moment you cut the check. And the risk is on them to pay the claims. Nobody gets hurt. They win. Everybody gets hurt. They lose. But the risk is on them. Now, another option, and this is something you guys are probably aware of, is called self-funding. Okay? Not San Francisco. And self-funding, if you think about it, right, that big building that they've got off 84 in Hartford, right, the profits that they're making for their shareholders, the money they're using to pay their employees, if you're an employer, why would you be sending money every month, every year, in the form of premiums to an insurance carrier to pay for their employees' company outing and pay for you know, their stained glass windows and pay for their profits? <coughs> right? Why are you paying for somebody else's profits? The reason is risk aversion. Risk aversion. And basically all that means is a lot of people will actually pay a premium, pay something extra to avoid risk. So even though I know there's a 9 out of 10 chance it would be cheaper for me not to buy auto insurance, keep the money, right? If that 1 out of 10 chance happens and I total my car, I can't afford that. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it's because you're so afraid of that one incident that absolutely would devastate you, you're willing to take it on the chin the other 9 out of 10 times. You get it? And so it's that risk aversion that causes each of us as individuals <coughs> to do things like buy auto insurance. But if you're an employer, you got deeper pockets. Right? You've got more money. Because the only thing that separates a fully funded insurance carrier and each of us as individuals is that risk pool I talked about. Because if they do take it on the chin on one of our claims, they got the rest of us to bear the loss. That makes sense? But if you're Walmart, you probably have just as many employees as Blue Cross has insured. Talk about a risk pool, right? You know, your Delta Airlines or your you know, Cirque du Soleil or any number of these different employers, right? You've got so many employees, they're all putting money in, even if one of those people ends up with cancer. You know, even if one of those people has a really bad car accident, you got all those other employees dumping money into the trust. So once you have a risk pool that's big enough, it's easier to self-fund. And instead of taking that money and paying the insurance company premiums, profits, right, you take that money and you put it into a bucket, a trust. And that's a word you should remember, that instead of premium, you have what's called contributions, okay? All right. A lot of people with self-funding, you know, employees and stuff, you get to a fight with them, and they're like, oh, I've been paying my premiums, how could you do this to me? I used to say, well, technically, sir, those are not premiums, those are contributions, and they would freak out, right? So I don't do that anymore, but there's a slight difference, right? The premium is the money, it's gone forever. The contributions go into the trust, okay? And that's another thing to remember, right? The trust, all right? Which, really, best way to think of it, just a bucket, a bucket full of money. And that's what the money goes into, okay? The trust bucket. So now if you're an employer, getting back to where we started, you've got two options. You can either pay premiums and you're gonna pay a little bit extra than you otherwise would have to avoid the risk, or you can take the money and you can put it into a self-funded plan or a trust. All right? Now, if you're an employer and you go with self-funding, The government rewards you for taking on these risks. And they passed, back in the 70s, a law which covers a lot of different things, like pensions and retirement funds, but it also covers employee benefit plans, health plans. Right? And there's one big federal law 
basically says, if you have employees in lots of different states, you can have one self-funded plan and apply it nationwide. Does anybody know what, what law that was? ERISA. You got it. All right. Sweet deal. ERISA. So ERISA basically allows you to do that. Now, ERISA doesn't do that for your fully funded insurance carrier. If you're in the business of insurance, all right, you literally have to abide by every state's law, which is why you see things like Blue Cross of Massachusetts, Blue Cross of Alabama. They basically have to take their company and split it into 50 sub-companies so each one can address that state's laws. They didn't want the Walmart self-funded benefit plan to have to do that. So you get to apply to one plan nationwide. It's a pretty sweet deal. Uh, so that's one reason to, to self-fund. Uh, another reason to self-fund, right? We talked about how this money includes profits and things like that. Well, if you're not putting this much into the trust instead, technically you should keep growing every year, right? Because Lord knows they weren't operating at a loss. So this is growing every year. That's another reason to save money. Um, if you have wellness programs, right, like we do. Every dollar you spend on wellness makes people healthier. It benefits you on the tail end, right? There's a return on your investment. Because, you know, if you do wellness here, you're just saving them money. If you do wellness here, you're saving yourself money. So there's a lot of different reasons. Another thing, if you go fully funded, you pay premiums, then they send you a booklet in the mail. Anybody know what that booklet is called? Fully funded insurance. After you get your auto insurance. Policy. Policy. Who said that? You got it. Policy. Right. Bingo. Policies. Policies and premiums. Those are two things that really only apply to fully funded insurance. When you self-fund, there isn't a policy. There's a plan document. With the policy. If I buy a policy with, let's say, Amica. I have Amica auto insurance. Do I get to call Amica and say, oh, you know, line four, I don't like that. No, I want to make this an and instead of an or. No, I'd like you to remove this exclusion. Do I get to customize my policy like that? No, it's a take it or leave it deal, right? Because it's their money, not mine, right? With a plan document, if you're an employer, you actually get to customize the plan. So if you're an ultra-religious, you know, Catholic-sponsored health plan, you know, you're a church plan, some sort of house of worship, down in, let's say, Tennessee, and you don't want to pay for things like contraceptives or plastic surgery or abortions, you can do that because it's your plan. You customize the plan document. But let's say you're a very liberal employer out in Beverly Hills, California, and you want to pay for things like cosmetic surgery. You can do whatever you want. Fully funded insurance carriers can't do that because the state law prevents them. Some states say, you have to cover this. Other states say, you're not allowed to cover that. Self-funding, a lot more flexibility in the plan creation, you make more money, all this stuff. So here's a question. Why wouldn't every employer self-fund? They don't want to take the risk. Right. And when is it more risky, would you say? When you have more employees. <clears throat> you have fewer employees. Right, exactly. Because think about it, if I've got two employees and we're both putting you know, 500 bucks into the plan every month, mm -hmm and one of us ends up with cancer, and it's a $500,000 claim, we're bankrupt. See what I'm saying? That risk pool, that risk pool. But interesting enough, if you're a small employer, there are times when self-funding could actually be good for you. You know, I know of a small employer in Braintree, Massachusetts, with just about 100 employees, which is really not that big for self-funding, who self-funded and saving a lot of money doing it. It's because in general, our staff is very healthy. If you look at our staff, it's a very low risk staff. So as a result, as a result, we end up saving money. Now if we were out in, I don't know, Minnesota and everybody spent every weekend like horseback riding or driving ATVs and drinking six packs of, you know, blue ribbon, then all of a sudden you're a lot more risky, you see. Or we look at the fact that, you know, we have excellent medical care in the Northeast, right? So all these different things go into making you guys a lower risk population. 
So even though we're not a very large employer, it still makes sense to sell fun. Change a couple things about you, and suddenly it doesn't make sense anymore. So those are, those are the two things to think about, the size of the risk pool and the riskiness of the risk pool. Okay? So you decide to self-fund. You've got your plan document, you're putting the money into the bucket, all this stuff. You've got your employer, they're self-funding. This new self-funded entity, this thing that provides benefits to employees, we've got a lot of different names for it. Anybody want to throw a name out? What do we call this, ent this entity that they created by self-funding? A group. A group. Okay, fine. There you go. That's one. We can call it the group. When we refer to the group, we are talking about the employer. All right? The employer, but more than just the employer. The plan document, the money, the members, everybody. It's the group. Anything else? When we talk about this employer benefit entity. The plan, we call it the plan all the time, right? The plan, okay? Group, plan, perfect, all right? Keep those in mind, right? We've got the SPD, which is the plan document, right? So we're getting all that, good, good, good. Going back to the employee. Now that you've got a plan, you're a part of the plan. You are a blank. Member. Member. Easy, I'm so happy. I'm taking that extra Red Bull. All right, so member, right. Now the problem is, in our industry, people throw around the word member all the time, but they're not just referring to the employee. Technically speaking, the word member is the employee. Because if this employee stopped being an employee, there would be no more membership in the plan. So when you think of the employee, right, um, we'll give this employee a name, somebody. What's the employee's name? Bob. Bob. All right, sweet, Bob. Nice to meet you, Bob. All right, and Bob, you know, Bob's a, a lucky guy. He's got a wife, right? He's got, he's got a couple kids, okay? AKA dependents, right? Mm -hmm. You guys know that dependents are not adult diapers. Okay, so kids, AKA dependents. Um, Bob, wife, kids, aka dependents. These guys are not technically members, right? Because if Bob loses the job, they lose membership. So the, what they do really has very little impact on membership, because they're not members. There is, however, a word we could use to cover everybody. Bob, the wife, the kids, everybody. Participants. Participants. Yeah. Getting too excited, sorry. All right. Participant. So member, participants, employee, employer, EE, the benefits, group plan, right? SPD, self-funding contributions going to the trust. Okay, great. This literally right here is the core. You got your employee and his family. You've got the uh, employer and their self-funded plan. The money that's going in. The plan document. There's one last thing to know about this structure. The employer will pick one, two, a handful of people to make tough decisions when it comes to the plan. Because unlike a carrier, where they make all the tough decisions, you just pay your premium every month, with a self-funded plan, the employer is, and I'll give you this one, it's legally, it's called a fiduciary. They're the last line, they're the one who makes the final decision, legally, ERISA says, you, the employer, you want to be self-funded? You want to take advantage of ERISA? You want to have all these benefits? You also have to have all the, the authority. You've got to make the tough decisions. And if you make the wrong decision, your employees could sue you right, for breach of fiduciary duty. You're the fiduciary. So employers will pick someone or someones to make those tough decisions, the plan administrator. You got it. Right, so we'll call it the PA. right? And this, this is the man with the big hat. right? The big old big hat. All right, he's got the big hat because he's got the important duties. Okay, plan administrator, fiduciary, that's the person who makes the final decision, the employer. Now, this plan administrator, he's got a big head, right, because he thinks he's all that, he thinks he's in charge, he thinks he makes the tough decisions, or she, could be she. Anyway, um, so plan administrator, bottom line is this employer, I don't know, 
They make vanilla uh, folders, right? That's what they do. They make folders. What do they know about medical bills? What do they know about insurance? What do they know about HICFAs and ICD-9s and EOBs and all the stuff you need to know to process claims? Nothing. The answer is nothing. They don't know anything about it. So what are they going to do? They got these buckets, right? Let's say the employee, he ends up getting hurt, right? He's hurt. And he's in an ambulance, right? There's your ambulance. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. They do wheels and everything. And it, it, the ambulance, you know, got to give the cross you know, it's just not an ambulance. There you go, ambulance. And it takes him to a hospital, okay? And we got the hospital, and, you know, big hospital, more than one floor, and they got the lobby, the columns. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> got to know your money's going somewhere, right? Okay, so they take him to the hospital, okay? Do they treat this person for free? Do they treat Bob for free? No, they gotta get paid, right? Well, if you wanna be paid and you provided a service, what are you gonna send to the plan? You know? Send them a bill, right? You build a plan. Well, the man in the big hat, he thinks so much of himself, but all of a sudden he realizes he doesn't know how to make heads or tails of a medical bill. So I got the money in one hand, I got the bill in the other hand, I got the plan document telling me what to do, but I'm lost. I'm lost. So what do you do? Call a TPA. Hire a TPA. TPA, which is a third party administrator. Okay? TPA, they don't have any money, they don't do anything. All they do is they take the money from you, the bills from the provider, they pay the provider the money from the from the bucket. And you know, every month or year, they just send you a report that let you know how your plan's going. And if they're smart, if a tough, ambiguous, difficult question comes in, they'll talk to you and counsel you and help you make a decision. The silly TPAs, what they'll do is try to make the decision themselves, which transforms them into that fiduciary we were talking about. And that gets them in a whole lot of trouble. Because when you stop asking the employer and start making your own decisions, you know what you start to look like? Yeah, and if that happens, there's a whole bunch of laws that apply now that you didn't want to apply to you. You don't want to be a fiduciary, you don't want to be a carrier, because if you were, you'd be charging premiums. If you're charging premiums, then that fancy building on 84 you're talking about. Trust me, I visit a lot of TPAs, not as fancy building. So, if you're going to make those tough decisions, you might as well get paid for it. So money goes to the TPA, TPA's paying whatever. And that right there is the self-funded plan structure. I mean, wow, perfect, right? It's, it's so beautiful. And, you know, except, except there's a couple, a couple snafus. And we're, this is what we're going to finish with. All right? If this could exist in a vacuum, everything would be fine. Perfect. But it can't. Because there may come a situation where you have a FIA group. And FIA is self-funded because we've got a healthy staff. We're confident we can afford it. God forbid somebody, you know, we're, we're going to one of the uh, FIA events, right? Like a barbecue or whatever. And you guys are carpooling, okay? And I got six of you in one vehicle. And it goes into a tree or it goes off a bridge. And you're not killed, which would be cheap because dead people don't run up claims, you know? Is that terrible? It's true, though. It is true. It's true. But it's math. It's science. You can't argue with it. You know? But you are all very seriously injured. This is a hit we didn't plan on. And there's not enough money in the bucket now. Right? Or let's say we empty the bucket. We have just enough to pay the bills, but now there's nothing left for anybody else. You're done for. Your plan is bankrupt. Right? I mean, that makes sense. So, what they allow these plans to do is purchase insurance, which a lot of regulators have issues with. Because think of it if you're an employer and you just bought fully funded insurance up front, state law applies. But if you're an employer and you self-fund, and when your self-funding runs out of money, 
or has a high claim, it can go to a fully funded insurance plan. In the end, isn't it kind of the same thing? And you're just sort of doing this to avoid state law? The big difference is, when you buy fully funded insurance, it's their responsibility to make the decisions. It's their responsibility to receive the bills. It's their responsibility to pay the claims to the provider. When you're self-funded, it's your responsibility to make the decisions. It's your responsibility to pay the claims. Best example I could give you. Let's say, let's say hypothetically, that your employer has fully funded insurance and somebody is hurt driving drunk. And let's say the policy says that if you're hurt committing an illegal act, insurance won't pay. So you're hurt, the hospital treats you, they send the bill to your insurance, your insurance does what? Deny it. Deny it. They don't pay. Right. You got it. So you know what happens then? The provider bills who? You. You! Bob! Where in that equation does the employer ever get involved? They don't. They don't. They don't. Bingo. Right. Exactly. With self-funding, let's say, same thing happens. Bob is hurt driving drunk. He's treated... Right? The bills come to the plan, and let's say the SPD, the plan document, says nothing about illegal acts. So the plan pays the claims. That's good for Bob. It's good for the provider. Right? But the plan is empty. So what does the plan do? Pause the plan with its insurance. And that insurance, that safety net insurance we're talking about, is called stop loss, stop loss or reinsurance. Okay? The, the words get used interchangeably. There's slight differences. Don't worry about those. Reinsurance, stop loss, call it what you want. Stop loss. But the stop loss has its own policy. And that policy says that if the plan pays for someone's claims arising from an illegal act, stop loss won't reimburse. Mm -hmm. Now, is the plan still required to pay? Yes. Hell yeah, it is. Because the plan document says nothing about illegal acts. Mm -hmm. And when they go to the stop loss carrier with their hands out and say, we paid all this money, our bucket is empty, help us. You know what stop loss is going to do? Yeah, tough. Exactly. Exactly. And that difference between the policy and the plan document, FYI, checking for that is one of the services our consulting team does for mining the gap, the gap in coverage. All right? And when that happens, then who's out of luck? The employer. The employer. Exactly. So with fully funded insurance, the employer was never on the hook. The self-funding, yes. That's the key difference. Even when you have stop loss. There's always the possibility that the employer is going to be left holding the bag. With fully funded insurance, there isn't. So if you ever bump into someone in Washington, D.C. who wants to fight you on this and thinks self-funding with stop loss is the same as fully funded insurance, you know how to argue against them. Right? Right? Well, if you don't, you can just watch the video, okay? Okay, so now we got our stop loss. The thing about stop loss is stop loss in general, like an employer, they've got the money but they don't necessarily want to deal with the buying and selling of plans, dealing with the documents, whatever. So what they'll do is they have these entities that come in that manage everything for them. Sort of like a TPA for stop loss. And that's a managing general underwriter, or as a lot of people know, MGU, you hear that term. So MGU, stop loss together, that's your protection. That's your excess protection. Um, let's run through some words, make sure you know. The amount of money that you need to pay before you can go to stop loss and get some money back, sort of that line in the bathtub that you have to fill up to before everything beyond it can be reimbursed, deductible. that line is called, deductible. it's a deductible, it's a spec deductible or specific deductible. deductible, just like all of us with our cards, right, or whatever, it's a deductible. Um, uh, trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, so da, 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 da. Okay, last one. Preferred provider organization. PPO. PPO. Pretty much everyone these days has a PPO. What a PPO is, it's like a middleman, a negotiator. They'll go in, they'll tell hospitals and providers, if you join the network and give discounts to the plan, the plan will pay you whatever you charge, minus the discount, within 30 days. 
but you got to promise to take that payment as payment in full, and you'll never balance bill bottom. But if the plan doesn't pay, per this arrangement, you can do whatever you want. And that's called a network arrangement or a network contract. And that, that's really what the PPOs do. And the problem is, these days, a lot of providers will charge, I don't know. Five times. Yeah, five times, seven times. Let's say, I'm gonna charge $50 for a Tylenol. Okay, $50 for a Tylenol. But don't worry, your PPO discount of 10% applies. So you're okay, right? You're getting a really good deal. Yeah, no, okay, you know, $45 for a time off is still too much, just in case you didn't know. A lot of these plan documents have language that says they only pay up to a certain amount, a usual and customary amount, which for a time off, if I'm being generous, is $5, not 50 and not 45. So what happens is the plan is between a rock and a hard place. Right? If I pay what my plan document tells me, stop loss will be happy, my bucket will be full, but the provider is going to balance bill the patient for the other $45 that I didn't pay. If I pay what the PPO network contract says, 45, right, 50 minus my 10% discount, provider's happy, it's not going to balance bill, but if that 45 puts me towards my spec, Stop was gonna say, whoa, wait a second. You paid $45 a Tylenol? What the hell's wrong with you? You know? We're not gonna reimburse you. So who do you serve? Right? And sort of that situation right now is one of the biggest issues in our industry. And it involves the plan sort of being stuck between the provider who wants their money for their contract, the patient, who if they get balanced bill, they're pissed. I thought I paid insurance for this, right? HR type stuff. You got the plan who just wants everyone to be happy. You got the stop loss who wants you to pay per the plan document. And you got the TPA who just doesn't know what to do. You know, do I pay you know, for the network or do I pay for your document and stop loss? You tell me what you want me to do. So those are pretty much all the entities that you're gonna find yourself dealing with and, and how they all relate to each other. I hope that makes a lot of sense to you guys. Does anybody have any questions?